I don't take great pleasure in every instance where I'm right. I want the plaintiffs in the civil suit against Salvaggio to succeed, not because I dislike Salvaggio. I neither like him nor dislike him. He seems like a reasonably en enough decent fella who made a terrible, terrible mistake. And he's standing by it. And I don't know exactly how I feel about that, but, you know. On the other hand, I have gotten to spend some time with Texas Wolfman and OG2 on my Discord server. And they both seem like decent men. And I'm not internet friends with anybody. But I wish them the best. I think their rights were stripped from them by Salvaggio et al. And I think they need to have those deprivations of their rights redressed. So this was filed today in the civil suit. And I'm going to read it for you, and I might interpose some of my own observations in it. I'll try to make it clear when I am speaking my mind rather than reading the courts. Order. Before the court is the pre-trial status of the above-referenced case. After some initial proceedings respecting a temporary restraining order and a request for a preliminary injunction, this civil rights action is now in a procedural posture where entry of a scheduling order is typically contemplated. A scheduling order is where they figure out, you know, when the, uh, when the various management um, hearings would be like uh, status conferences or case management conferences or, you know, when, when the trial would be held and all that other fun stuff, when discovery has to end by, etc., But in the somewhat unusual circumstances presented, as discussed more fully below, entry of a scheduling order and proceeding with discovery and other pretrial matters is not appropriate at this time. Instead, a slower approach to pretrial matters is the most appropriate course. Three reasons support the slow approach for pretrial matters now ordered in this civil rights case. First, the undersigned's October 19th report and recommendation at docket number 62 reflects the plaintiff's request for preliminary injuncted, injunctive relief is unfounded. There is, in other words, no exigent circumstance demanding an immediate start to full-blown discovery or expedited resolution of plaintiff's 1983 claims. Add to that consideration, and as the undersigned previously explained in the above-referenced report and recommendation, the credible testimony of Chi Salvaggio and questioning of him by plaintiff's counsel at the October 4th preliminary injunction hearing strongly suggests that forging ahead with this civil case at this time may be or may inappropriately impede several interrelated and intertwined ongoing criminal investigations and prosecutions. Now I'm going to interject here that for everybody who thought that that testimony of Salvaggio doomed him. This is the second time that the court has said that it was credible testimony. You all need to stop hearing what you want to hear and seeing what is actually on paper in black and white. I can't read the court's mind, but the court is giving some pretty strong indicia that they believed Salvaggio. So, so bear that in mind when you're making your speculations. And added to these two concerns, it now also appears that these civil proceedings threaten to devolve into a distracting spectacle, especially if the civil case proceeds contemporaneously with the aforementioned state investigations and prosecutions. The simple solution of temporary, temporarily stay in these civil proceedings under the court's discretionary authority to manage its docket and the progress of pretrial proceedings is the best course at this juncture. On November 13, 2018, defendants filed an advisory explaining that excerpts of an audio recording of official court proceedings from the October 4th preliminary injunction hearing have been posted on the YouTube by, and then in quotes, lead plaintiff James Miller, 
end quote, in alleged contravention of this court's prior orders and in an apparent attempt to under, undermine Chief Salvaggio's authority. See docket number 64. The posted recording was apparently prefaced by the following text. In this short preview clip, you will hear the attorney for the plaintiffs, Solomon Radner, questioning, and then in all caps, defendant, Joe Salvaggio, about a, and then in quotes, failure to identify, end quote, arrest of a, and then in all caps, witness in Texas. Joe is, in quotes, on the stand, end quotes, in front of a federal judge. Joe is finding it extremely difficult to be, in quotes, in caps, in charge, end quote. Excerpts from Miller's YouTube posting set forth in defendant's advisory emphasis in original. Plaintiff subsequently filed a response admitting that Plaintiff Jack Miller posted the material online on YouTube, but plaintiffs also noted that Miller is not the, in quotes, lead plaintiff, end quote, and that, in any event, Miller lawfully acquired a copy of the audio recording from the clerk's office, see docket number 65. It is the practice in the undersigned's court that most proceedings are placed on an official record, primarily via audio recording equipment, rather than the use of a court reporter and a written transcript, unless a written transcript is later needed or requested, in which case a transcript is typically produced with reference to the audio recording. At the aforementioned hearing on plaintiff's preliminary injunction request, signs posted outside the courtroom, citing Federal Rule of, Civ of Criminal Procedure 53, explained that the recording or broadcasting of judicial proceedings from the courtroom was prohibited. At the start of the hearing, the undersigned also informed those present in the courtroom of this prohibition. Such an instruction was in keeping with the local rules for the Western District of Texas, which provide as follows. Photographing, broadcasting, or televising any judicial proceeding, or any person directly or indirectly involved in a proceeding, whether court is in session or not, in or from any part of the United States courthouse, is prohibited, except with permission of the judge presiding. Audio recorders, audio or video recording cell phones, or other means of recording the proceedings must not be brought into a courtroom, except with the permission of the judge presiding. This rule does not apply to such recorders or other devices used by and under the direction and control of a judicial officer or the court reporter. Local Rule AT-5M-L There is perhaps room to debate about whether a party's online posting, with some brief commentary, of an official recording without prior permission from the court violates the aforementioned rules, the signs posted outside the courtroom, the undersigned's verbal instructions to those, to those present in the courtroom, or the standards and rules generally governing the behavior demanded and expected of those participating in federal litigation. But, as a matter of public policy, courts should, be, should avoid becoming the instrumentalities of commercial or other private pursuits, citing U.S. v. McDougall. And here, Mr. Miller did not merely post an official recording. He did so in an apparent attempt to disparage another litigant in this pending action, Chief Salvaggio. See excerpts from Miller's YouTube posting set forth in Defendant's Advisory. Of course, it is not entirely uncommon for publicly available court recordings to be posted online, yet perhaps much less so when done by a party seeking to disparage a litigation adversary. adversary. This is me interposing at this point. I, I knew it was a terrible idea for uh, Miller to do it. Um, you can consider this to be a huge shot across the bow by the judge, the magistrate in this. Uh, Miller was stupid. He did a stupid thing. Uh, for those of you who doubted uh, anybody's claims that Miller was stupid, well, here's your sign. I'm, I'm sure that Radner is very thrilled about, number one, having to file docket number 65 to try to defend Miller's stupid behavior. Oh, look, the, the plaintiff's the plaintiff's attorney was stupid for doing it. No, Miller was stupid for doing it. Miller advertised it as a leak. The judge isn't stupid. I said it before. I'll say it again. It was dumb. 
and Miller wants to give other people advice on how to do their shit. No, no. Miller's a retard and he needs to stay under his rock. This is just stupid. It was a stupid move. As a, as a litigant, you shut your mouth and you let your lawyer do their job and you don't make it harder for your lawyer because if you make it harder for your lawyer, you're making it harder for yourself. And I can only imagine that the other litigants, the other plaintiffs are and should be rightfully upset with Miller for being such a jackwad. It was dumb. It was stupid. It was foolhardy. He should have talked to his lawyer first, cleared it with his lawyer, and his lawyer would have said, dude, just shut the fuck up. Just shut up. Quit making videos. Just shut up. Let me deal with this. Just shut up. But we're back on the, uh, the reading now. Ultimately, there is no need to address at this time whether a violation or other sanctionable conduct has occurred. The undersigned has determined that the current climate of the case presents an unacceptably high risk of steering proceedings to a place where they could be used for improper purposes, could devolve into a spectacle that diminishes the dignity of the federal court, or could inappropriately interfere with ongoing state criminal investigations or prosecutions. This is evident from the questioning of Chief Salvaggio at the preliminary injunction hearing, counsel's agitated demeanor in the courtroom in the presence of the undersigned, the inflammatory rhetoric employed in briefing submitted to the, count, to the court, and finally, perhaps also, from Mr. Miller's YouTube posting. Ding, ding, ding. For example, counsel for plaintiffs accuses, this is a footnote, for example, counsel for her plaintiffs accuses defendants of purposefully misleading the court, issuing salacious lies, showing repeatedly they don't believe in or respect the Constitution, and demonstrating to the court that nothing defendants say about the plaintiffs can be trusted. See docket number 65 at 2 to 3 dash to 8, 2 to 3 comma 8. Such characteriza characterization of a party opponent's conduct should be sparingly employed by counsel and should be reserved only for those instances in which there is a sound basis in fact, demonstrating a party's deliberate and intentional disregard of an order of the court or of obligations imposed under the applicable federal rules of civil procedure. Quoting Dondi Props Corp v. Commerce Savings and Loan Association. Emphasis added. Such allegations, when inappropriately made, as it appears to be in the case here, add much heat but little light to the court's task of deciding disputes. Who possibly could have saw that coming? As the local rules explain, neither written submissions nor oral presentations should disparage the integrity, intelligence, morals, ethics, or personal behavior of an adversary unless such matters are directly relevant under the controlling substantive law. See Local Rule 80-4A. While the court understands and certainly expects counsel to zealously advance the legitimate interests of their clients, appropriate standards of civility and decorum must still be maintained. See above. Accordingly, in dealing with others, a lawyer should reflect or should not reflect any ill feeling, feelings that the client may have toward the adversary. A lawyer should treat all other lawyers, all parties, and all witnesses courteously, not only in court, but also in other written and oral communication. See above. A lawyer must never be unfair or abusive or inconsiderate to adverse witnesses or opposing litigants or ask any question not intended to legitimately impeach, but only to insult or degrade the witness. Local Rule 80-5D. Counsel should avoid disparaging personal remarks or acrimony toward opposing counsel. Same as above at 80-5E. And especially pertinent to Mr. Miller's YouTube posting, even if it didn't occur in the courtroom, counsel must also advise the client, witnesses, and spectators of the behavior and decorum required in the courtroom and take all reasonable steps to prevent disorder or disruption of court proceedings. AT-5F. The dignity, decorum, and courtesy that traditionally characterize the courts of civilized nations are not empty formalities. They are essential 
to a courtroom atmosphere in which justice can be achieved, Local Rule 80-5, emphasis added. The undersigned has the authority to control the pace and progress of pretrial matters, including authority to stay a case for a specified duration. That authority is particularly relevant here in light of the above and where the record also reveals that ongoing proceedings in this civil action could interfere with ongoing criminal investigations or prosecutions involving some of the plaintiffs in this case, as well as several of their alleged associates. Accordingly, the undersigned finds that putting matters in this case on hold, at least temporarily, to permit the authorities' time to conduct their investigations is the best course of action scheduling-wise. Moreover, without such action, there is also a risk that matters in this court will devolve into something akin to a sideshow, which the undersigned will not permit. A number of possible next steps have been previously raised or discussed with the parties. These ideas include possibly staying matters as to only some plaintiffs but not others, staying the entire proceedings pending cr ongoing criminal investigations and prosecutions involving some but not necessarily all of the plaintiffs, and seeking some kind of out-of-court resolution of the dispute. As none of these possible approaches has garnered much support from the parties, and as defendants have not sought to stay on, the, on grounds other than younger abstention, and even then the argument was raised only in response to plaintiff's preliminary injunction request and not via motion, the undersigned will exercise this court's inherent authority over a pretrial and scheduling matters to stay all proceedings in this case, except as discussed below, for a period of six months. At the conclusion of the six months from the date of this order, the parties should confer and file a joint advisory with the court discussing their respective views on whether the case is then ready to proceed or should remain stayed. They should include all relevant supporting authority as well as any relevant specific facts. To the extent defendants believe Younger or some other abstention doctrine is appropriate here, they should make that argument at that time via motion and with supporting authorities an argument that also addresses the specific concerns the undersigned previously expressed regarding these matters. The court is chiding the defendants for not raising the Younger abstention as a motion. Not as bad as they were as the court was um, dressing down the plaintiffs and their counsel, but they were definitely chiding the counsel for defense or counsels for defenses, I guess. I don't know. To reiterate, there is ample authority for delaying entry of a scheduling order and imposing a stay here. Stays like this may be entered as a matter of discretion over scheduling. They may also issue in analogous, if not perfectly identical, situations where ongoing criminal proceedings or investigations are threatened by continuing with a related civil case. Indeed, the Fifth Circuit has recognized that, due to the significant public interest in law enforcement, criminal prosecutions often take priority over civil actions, and therefore a stay of civil litigation may be sought to protect the integrity of criminal investigations, citing INRI Grand Jury Subpoena. And, when faced with uncertainty regarding whether an adjudication of a 1983 claim will impact a potential criminal conviction, courts in this circuit have concluded that the civil proceedings should be stayed until the pending criminal case has run its course, citing Santos v. White. In determining whether a civil action or civil discovery should be allowed to proceed in light of an impending criminal case, the Fifth Circuit directs district courts to employ judicial discretion and procedural flexibility to harmonize the conflicting rules and to prevent the rules and policies applicable to one suit from doing violence to those pertaining to the other, citing Henry Grand Jury Subpoena. In balancing these competing interests, district courts in the circuit often consider the, consider the following. Number one, the extent to which the issues in the criminal case overlap with those presented in the civil case. Two, the status of the case, including whether the criminal defendant has been indicted. Three, the private interests of the plaintiff in proceeding expeditiously weighed against the prejudice to the plaintiff caused by the delay. Four, the private interests of and burden on the defendants. Five, the interests of the courts. And six, public interests. Citing Billiot v. Beavers. These considerations also merit in imposing the contemplated stay in this case. First, there appears to be substantial overlap between the underlying criminal the underlying state criminal proceedings and investigations and the instant federal actions, 
many of the current criminal charges against several plaintiffs in the anticipated criminal charges arise from the same set of operative facts that underlie this civil case. As to the second consideration, this case is still in its early stages. Conversely, the record appears to reflect that criminal charges have been initiated and are ongoing against plaintiffs Bailey, Brown, Springer, Miller, Green, and Howd, and the Leon Valley Police Department has requested that criminal charges be filed against several other plaintiffs. With respect to considerations four and six, while plaintiffs have an interest in the prompt determination of their 1983 claims, that interest is far outweighed, under the circumstances of this case, by defendants and the public's interest in ensuing any and all alleged criminal offenses are thoroughly investigated and appropriately prosecuted. Moreover, imposing the contemplated stay would not unduly prejudice plaintiffs. As to the fifth consideration, the court has a strong interest in ensuing in ensuring that federal civil proceedings do not undermine legitimate law enforcement investigations and state court criminal proceedings. When considering the appropriateness of a stay, a judge should be, se be sensitive to differences or the difference in the rules of discovery in civil and criminal cases. While the federal rules of civil procedure have provided a well-stocked battery of discovery procedures, the rules governing civil discovery are far more restrictive. At the October 4th preliminary injunction hearing, counsel for plaintiffs solicited testimony, oddly without defendant's objection, regarding ongoing, perhaps confidential, criminal investigations relating to plaintiffs and their alleged associates. This type of civil discovery could not proceed or could not provide a means to circumvent the normal criminal discovery rules, as well as run roughshod over the confidentiality of law enforcement investigative efforts. See above. A litigant should not be allowed to make use of the liberal discovery procedures applicable to a civil suit as a dodge to avoid the restrictions on criminal discovery and thereby obtain documents he would not otherwise be entitled for use in his criminal suit. Additionally, the court has interests in judicial economy and expediency, citing Dovey Morris. Stay in this case at this juncture may prevent the court from making rulings regarding potential discovery disputes involving issues that may be affecting ongoing criminal matters and investigations. See Billiot. And while the court undoubtedly has an obligation to move its document and not let cases languish before it, see Dovey Morris, a six-month stay will not deserve this important interest under the circumstances presented here. Further, as discussed in detail elsewhere, there also appears to be sufficient basis to stay under the doctrine of a younger abstention, at least perhaps with respect to some of the plaintiffs here. With no party having provided any suggestion as to how or why a stay should or ought to operate as to some but not all plaintiffs, it is apparent under the circumstances presented that the whole case should simply be stayed so as to keep it on a uniform track while also taking into account all the various concerns already discussed. There is a limited exception to the stay. All matters in this case will immediately cease and be stayed, except, of course, for the district court's action on plaintiff's pending objections to the undersigned's recommendation on the propriety of a preliminary injunction. The parties may also seek reconsideration of this order, as a party is entitled to do in the ordinary course. And, of course, to the extent the district court disagrees with the undersigned's recommendation on the preliminary injunction issue, a lifting of the stay may be appropriate at that time. Moreover, the stay put in effect here to effectuate the court's wishes with respect to the scheduling of pretrial matters should not be construed by any party to affect their substantive rights, including the right to seek an appeal from the district court's order on plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction. Finally, and to be clear, the relevant investigative and prosecutorial authorities should feel unrestrained to investigate and pursue any criminal matters related to these proceedings as may be appropriate under the constraints and restrictions that normally apply to any such investigations or prosecutions. Should any individual feel or his or her rights may or have been violated as a result of any such investigation or proceeding, that matter to the extent it is a party's wish to bring it to this court's attention, can be addressed once the state in this case is lifted. It is so ordered, signed by the magistrate. So uh, for everybody who was just all gung-ho over the, uh, the leak that Miller did and uh, Salvaggio's testimony and the plaintiff's motion regarding the leak that Miller did and plaintiff's uh, response to that motion. Uh, it It's shaken out like I thought it would. Um, I strongly suspect that the 
that the federal judge, the uh, district court judge, who's going to be reviewing this and signing off on it, will sign off on it. I think he will also sign off on the uh, on the magistrate's uh, opinion denying the um, preliminary injunction. Of course, I could be wrong. I'm not a federal district judge, so take that with a grain of salt. But uh, I just want to I just want to remind everybody to to stay grounded. Um, this case is not done yet. I strongly suspect that it isn't lost yet either. Uh, but the the plaintiffs need to shape up. They really do. And uh, it certainly I certainly think that uh, rights were violated, as I've said earlier. Um, but you guys, the, the plaintiffs aren't doing themselves any favors. And you guys who are thinking that the plaintiffs are doing themselves favors, you're you're wishful thinking. That's all you're doing. Anyway, thanks for watching. I apologize for it being so long. Have a great evening.